All right, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the introduction to Q Greenland workshop for QGIS beginners. Um, my name is Lynn Hardin and I am the education and evaluation specialist for the Q Greenland team. And I apologize for my voice. I usually don't sound like this, but I am battling an unfortunate case of laryngitis, but I think, I think I'll be able to make it through the next few hours. Um, so I, like I said, I'm the education evaluation specialist on the Q Greenland team, um, but my background is actually in earth science. I'm an earth scientist by training, and for my PhD work, I studied coastal geology, and I used GIS and geospatial data sets pretty extensively um, in my PhD work, but I've been doing education and outreach for many years now. Um, so again, if you haven't introduced yourself in the chat box, go ahead and do that now just so we can get a sense of everybody that we have here. And before we really get into it, I just wanna cover a few housekeeping um, notes here. So uh, try to stay muted when you're not speaking just so we can minimize any um, distracting sounds. If you do have a question or want to make a comment about anything, feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom, or you can simply just type it into the chat. We're gonna be monitoring, monitoring that the entire time so we can make sure to answer everybody's questions. If you haven't already, you'll want to download um, both the QGIS software and the Q Greenland data package. And um, another member of the Q Greenland team here is gonna put that, that link in the chat box so that it, if you haven't done that, you can easily just go ahead and access that. You'll wanna do that now because we will be using the QGIS interface um, together, running through some examples of how to do things. So it will be important to make sure that you can have access to that. Additionally, in the email that you got a week ago, you should have gotten a link to a Google Drive folder where there are workshop materials. And here is the link to that. So that drive folder contains different um, documents that we'll be using and data sets throughout this workshop. So just make sure that you can access that and let us know if you have any trouble. You'll notice that those documents are view only, meaning that you will not be able to edit them yourselves. So if you would like to have an editable copy for yourself, if you wanna take notes in it or just make some comments on your own document, you can either make a copy for yourself and move it out of that drive folder, or you can download those documents um, and save them onto your computer. Both, both should work. Okay, just a quick run through of what we're going to be doing today. And it's gonna to be a jam packed day, um, but let me know if you have any questions along the way or if we're moving too quickly. Uh, so we'll get into a tour of Q Greenland right after this. So I'll explain a little bit um, about, well, actually our, our PI Twi will explain a little bit about what Q Greenland is and what's included in the download package. Um, and then we'll do a really brief introduction to QGIS and take a guided tour of the QGIS interface and talk a little bit about what the different data set types uh, in QGIS are look at some of the layer properties and how you figure those things out. And then we'll really get into the meat. The QGIS processing toolbox is really what makes QGIS a powerful geospatial analysis tool. So we'll do some, some neat examples of how you can analyze Q Greenland data using that processing toolbox. Uh, we will create new data sets from scratch. We'll import new data sets into our Q Greenland project. And then we'll learn how to edit existing data layers. And then finally, we'll learn how to make a map for print or publication. So that's what we're looking at today. All right, so I've already introduced myself, but I'm going to ask the rest of the Q Greenland development team to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much. Delighted to have you at our first Q Greenland training workshop. This is really exciting for us. My name is Twyla Moon. I'm the project lead. Um, I'm a deputy lead scientist at National Snow and Ice Data Center and um, just really pleased to see everyone. And we're as a team really looking forward to helping you be able to use this tool um, in ways that we've thought of and hopefully ways we haven't thought of too. So looking forward to it. Thanks, Lynn. I'm Matt Fisher. I'm a software developer uh, working with Trey on uh, Q Greenland for the last year or so, and uh, I'm excited to be here and see you all. And uh, I'm Trey. I'm the other uh, software developer that's been working uh, on Q Greenland for 
uh, with Matt for about the last year or so. Um, been at NSIDC for about the last five, and uh, my background is in GIS and remote sensing. So uh, happy to help answer any questions that you may have. Great, thanks everybody. All right, so I'm gonna pass it back over to Twyla and she's gonna tell us more about what Q Greenland is and the motivation for the project. Hi, um, those of you who are on the line and might have been previously um, in glaciology um, no, may have heard of another QGIS package called Quantarctica. And if you become excited using QGreenland, you might want to check that out too. Um, and it was a GIS package built for Antarctica. And many of us who worked more in the Arctic uh, were really hoping to see something like this created for Greenland. And we were lucky enough to find excellent support from the National Science Foundation EarthCube project, which is all about data um, access and uh, bringing geoscience data to the fore. And uh, with our National Science Foundation grant, we're building and now have built version 1.0 um, that you are all using, but we'll be continuing development. And the idea was to build something a bit different from Quantarctica in the sense that this is a fully open source, open platform platform tool. Everything th that you need software wise to use it is free. So it's um, a lot easier to use in kind of education settings. Um, and it's designed to work entirely um, uh, offline, although we're experimenting with some online access because there's a few benefits there. But needless to say, it's something that you can download, you can take with you um, to the field and uh, have kind of all the power of the data within it and all the power of the QGIS um, pro platform that it works on, um, which Lynn will, um, all of this will continue to make sense if it feels like a lot of uh, letters uh, running around at this point. But the idea was to kind of curate um, some Greenland data so that it wasn't as hard for people to get into playing with geospatial data and you could discover uh, new data and new topics um, along with whatever uses you might have for planning or analysis or creating beautiful figures. Great, thanks Twyla. All right. Um, so like Twyla said, there's a lot, there's a lot of letters being thrown around, around and um, the, the main set is GIS or QGIS. So just really quickly, what are these things since this is the, the uh, workshop for beginner QGIS users? So GIS means geographic information system. And it really just refers to a program that lets you view and analyze geospatial data. So data that has a location associated with it. And QGIS is a specific um, kind of GIS software. So there are others there. Um, you might have heard of ArcMap or ArcGIS. But what makes QGIS great is that, like Twyla said, it's a free open source software. Um, and so that's a, a much more accessible software uh, for anybody to use. At, if you've played around with it, um, or as you might find today, because it is free and open source, that means it might have a few bugs in it. So you might experience some weird things here and there. And just know that that's pretty normal. Um, and you'll learn to work your way around those things. That also being said, just like with any project you're working on, it's a good idea to save often if you are making changes to a QGIS project. But just know that if you do save a QGIS project, and this will become more apparent here in a second, it will overwrite the project you're working on. So I recommend for the Q Greenland data project, when you save it in QGIS, give it a different name just so you don't overwrite um, the original Q Greenland data, data package file. All right, so let's do a quick run through of what's included in the Q Greenland um, base package. And so if you've downloaded the Q Greenland data package, you should see a um, similar set of folders and documents here. So first, all of these folders contain the various data layers that are included in the Q Greenland download package. And you'll notice that we've, um, we've organized them by topic. So if you were to click on any one of these folders, you'll find within them there are other nested folders and data sets that are all relate to this more general topic.
this layer underscore list CSV file is a very simple spreadsheet that lists all of these data sets that I just described in those folders and information about them. So if you're just curious about all of the possible data sets that are included in QGreenland um, and you want to see that in an easily scannable format, you can just look at this spreadsheet and get an, get an idea of what those layers are. We created a couple of user guides for Q Greenland as well. So there is a full user guide available that explains all the things that we'll talk about in this workshop and more. And there's also a much shorter quick start guide that's just kind of how do you get going in Q Greenland. There are a couple of other documents and uh, files in this folder that we aren't going to go into too much. They relate to if you're interested in, in contributing data to Crew Greenland, how do you do that? Uh, but for the purposes of this workshop, we're just going to skip to this qgreenland.qgs file, which is the qgreenland QGIS project file. So that .qgs file extension is the extension that all QGIS um, project files have. So I'll encourage you to go ahead and open that file um, on your own computer. Once you open it, it should open QGIS with the QGreenland data package already loaded. Um, since we'll be looking at that together in a second, it would be good to just go ahead and get that going. All right. Um, I'm going to pause here for maybe two minutes or so just to let everybody open that project file and also um, take a couple minutes just to look through what's included in the QGreenland data package yourself. So feel free to browse through those folders to see the different data, uh, data layers that are included. You can take a look at that CSV file that lists all the data layers. And then, like I said, go ahead and open that QGreenland um, data file or project files so that we can get going. So I'll give everybody about one to two minutes to do those things and then we'll pick back up here in a second. There's a great question in the chat box. Um, will we be modifying the same project? And so if so, is it a good idea to make a copy? Uh, yes, yes to both. So yeah, we'll be modifying the original Q Greenland project file. So you can either make a copy or you can just save it as a different name. Um, those are both good ideas. Okay, so Let's keep moving forward. So I want to give you a really quick view of the QGIS interface, just so um, you're oriented to the different parts of it. And before I do that, I just want to note that your interface might look different from mine for multiple reasons. Um, so I'm running QGIS version 3.10 on a MacBook Pro. So if you're running a different version of QGIS or you're running it on a different operating system, it might look a little different to you and that's okay. Another reason is that as we'll see, the QGIS interface is actually very customizable. And so you might see different parts of it in different places and that's also okay. And I'll show you how you can move those around if you so desire. So I'm gonna start at the bottom of the interface here and then move my way up. So I know this is really small, but if you're looking at your own interface, you'll see the very bottom here, we call this the status bar. And the status bar tells you a few important things about your QGIS project. Um, one of the main ones on the right here is what we call the coordinate, coordinate reference system or the projection for your uh, project. 
And what that means is like any map that we're looking at, it has a certain projection. And it's important when you're working in a geospatial um, uh, software like QGIS that you know what that is and that your project is set to a particular coordinate reference system. Um, in this case, so this here says EPSG 3413. So that is, oh, I believe that is the NSIDC Sea Ice Polar Stereographic North. So it's the projection, the coordinate reference system that we chose for the Q Greenland data package. Um, so yours should say something similar if you indeed have the Q Greenland project file open. And then there's some co a couple of other things here. Um, on the very far left of the status bar, if you move your mouse around what we call the map view, these numbers will change and it just tells you the position of your mouse within the coordinate reference frame of the map view. So let's talk about the map view. The map view is the main portion of the software interface where we see all of our, our spatial information, all of our data sets. Um, so this will change depending on the data sets that we toggle on and off um, or data sets that we add or take away. And the data sets that are shown in that map view all, are all listed over here in the layers panel. And again, this might look different in your interface and that's okay. So on the left, this layers panel has a list of all of the layers in the Q Greenland data package. And you'll notice that they're organized in the same way that they are in those folders. So they're organized into what we call layer groups. So the main layer group has a little arrow next to it. And if you click on that arrow, which we'll do here in a second, when we switch over to, to the QGIS interface, you'll see that nested within that main layer group are sub layers that fit into that group. So if you click the box next to any of these layers, it'll check them and that should toggle them on. There are some um, subtleties here where if you don't have the main layer group toggled on, but you toggle on some of the sub layers, they won't show unless you toggle on the main layer group. And again, this is just something that you figure out by kind of playing around with it and checking those on and off yourself. The reason why we call data sets layers in GIS uh, is because when we view them, they're literally layered one on top of another. And the way that we know the layer order is they're listed in order in the layers panel. So the layers that are listed at the top are the ones that are going to be on top in the map view. And then the layers that are listed at the bottom are the ones that are going to be on the bottom of the map view. And so there might be some layers that although they're toggled on, you can't see them. And the reason is that there might be a layer further up that is toggled on that's just covering it, just so you know. All right, moving up, um, I have this panel open here, which is just a panel that can help me navigate to any part, any file in my computer that if I wanted to add another layer or uh, open a new project file, um, this is called a browser panel. I often just close this um, because it just kind of uh, gets in the way. The way you can close these things is there's a little X up here you can just click on. Um, moving up again, so all of these buttons that you see here on the top and then going down the side, these are toolbars. Um, they're actually individual toolbars and we'll look at them more closely here in a second. But these buttons are going to be really powerful. These are what allow us to do everything from um, open up new data layers, create new data layers to analyzing our Q Greenland data. And then finally, the very top here is our menu bar. And again, a lot of the functions that you find in the menu bar are actually going to be in the toolbar too. Um, what you'll discover is there are, is more often than not more than one way to do something in QGIS, uh, I, whether it's using a button in the toolbar or um, going to one of the menus in the menu bar and, and, and navigating from there. So really whatever works best for you, you'll find um, you, can, you can do many functions. All right. Okay, so we are going to switch now over to the QGIS interface and look at it together. Um, and just a note, I encourage you uh, to do the same tasks that I'm doing in QGIS as I'm doing them, just so you can make sure um, that you're doing them correctly or just if anything comes up that you have questions about, um, you'll know that right away. So I'm going to head and go click out of this slideshow and go to the QGIS interface. Can everybody see that okay? All right. Okay, um, 
So when, when I open the Q Greenland project file, this is what it looks like for me. Some of you may also see this. I'm actually going to click out of here for now. Um, I actually don't have anything in the map view. That's just how it shows up for me. Some of you might actually see some of the geospatial data sets here. If you don't, a very easy way to bring them into view is to go to layer in the menu bar. Oops, sorry, view in the menu bar right next to it. And then go down to where it says zoom full. And if you do that, what'll happen is it'll bring the, um, all of the data sets that are included in the Q Greenland data package into view. So it basically scales it to the largest extent data set. Um, another really easy way to do that is in one of the toolbars up here, you'll see a button that has that same symbol. And if you hover over it, it will say zoom full. You can also click on that and that'll do the same thing. Um, if you don't have these buttons or this particular toolbar, you can add it. So I mentioned that this interface is fully customizable. So you can add or take away any of these toolbars or you can move them around the interface to be in a position that best works for you. Similarly, these panels you can add or remove or you can move them to different locations on the side of the interface for the setup that works best for you. Um, so just to show you how to do that with the toolbars, so you'll notice these the different toolbars up here. I know they kind of look like one big mass of buttons, but they're individual toolbars. They're separated from one another by two columns of dots. If you hover your mouse over those two columns of dots, it'll tell you the name of that particular toolbar. And that's important because throughout the workshop, I'll be referring to those toolbars by name. So it might be helpful just to know how to find those names. When you hover over those two columns of dots, you'll also notice that you'll get this little arrow um, icon. And that means, of course, that you can click on that and then move it around to anywhere you want on your interface. So that's how you can customize where those toolbars are. If you don't see a particular toolbar that you need to use, you can right click on the toolbar. And then this window that comes up are all the possible panels and toolbars that can be visible in your QGIS interface. And so you can just toggle on or off anything that you want or don't want visible in your interface. So again, if you didn't see that zoom full button that I just mentioned, um, that's probably because your map navigation toolbar is not turned on. So just wanna make sure that it's toggled on here. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to come back over to this layers panel for one moment. And so I kind of described how this works. Again, the layers at the top are the ones that are on the, the top of in the map view layer. And the ones at the bottom of the layers panel are the layers that are, are in the bottom of the map view. So again, they might be obscured if there's a layer that's currently toggled on that's over top of them. Um, take a minute to play around with this layers panel. So again, toggle things on and off, get a sense of how, how the layers panel works. Um, a reminder again, that you can click on these little arrows to open up these main layer groups and see the individual layers that are nested within them. And then you can toggle on those individual layers to see them in the map view. Um, a way to zoom in or out of this map view is to use buttons also in this map navigation toolbar. So you can use zoom in or zoom out buttons to change the view in your map view. So I'm just gonna zoom in so that we have Q Greenland filling up or Q Greenland filling up the map view. The, the layers in the layer panel, you can move these around. So if you don't like the way that we decided to order the layers, you can actually change that. And it's very simple how you do that. You just click on the layer that you want to move to a different place and then just drag it. So drag it to anywhere you want in this layers panel. All right, so I'm gonna stop there and I wanna give you um, 
about three to five minutes to kind of explore this QGIS or a QGIS interface in the Q Greenland data package on your own. Um, a way to really learn QGIS is just to play around with it and get, get familiar with the interface and how things work. To help you out, I have come up with some practice tasks that you can find in the workshop Google Drive folder. So if you open up the workshop Google Drive folder, there is a document called workshop practice tasks. And within that, we are going to do the practice task set number one tour the interface. So these are just targeted tasks that will help you to explore the interface and become more familiar with it. Um, so take a minute, you can either explore the interface on your own as you wish, or if you need some guidance, go ahead and, and do these practice tasks. So we'll um, come back together in about three to five minutes.
All right, before we get going again, I just want to take a moment and open it up to any questions. So if you have any questions so far about anything, feel free to either um, raise your hand or just type your question into the chat box and we can talk. All right, well, I don't see any questions, but if they come up again, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we will answer them. All right, so I'm going to switch back to the QGIS interface here. Whoop. Okay. Actually, I am going to Go back to our slides and then I'll come back to the interface. All right, so um, the next thing that I want to talk about before we look at some of these specific Q Greenland data layers and, and start to learn how to analyze them um, are the two main types of data layers in QGIS. So there's there's more than two types of data layers in QGIS, but for our purposes, we're going to talk about the two main, main ones. So the first type of, of data set that you'll find in QGIS, one of the more common ones are what we call vector layers. So these are discrete um, points, lines, or polygon layers. Uh, so just to give you some examples from Q Greenland of these different types of vector layers. So we have a layer called towns and settlements, and that's a point layer. So that's the one shown over here on the far left. So you can see all these little points are locations of towns and settlements in Greenland. And each of these different points has some information associated with it. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So the second time type of vector layer are lines. So in the middle here, we're showing an example from Q Greenland, which are land streams in, in Greenland. So you'll see that there's all these little lines here. And those are all parts of the land streams vector layer. And just like this towns and settlements point layer, all of these lines have um, information associated with them. And then finally on the far right here is an example of a polygon vector layer. Um, in Q Greenland, we have a polygon layer called bird protected areas. So now those are these, these red striped polygons here. And again, just like the points and the lines, each of these individual polygons has information associated with it and all these polygons together make up this bird protected areas layer. So vector layers are discrete points, lines, or polygons. All right, so I mentioned that every feature within a vector layer, so every individual point, line, or polygon has information associated with this. And this can be a wide variety of things. Um, the way that you can access that information is by um, opening up what's called the vector attribute table. And I'll show you how to do that here in a second in QGIS, but I just wanted to show you an example of what the attribute table for a Q Greenland layer we have called the called Common Mirror Colonies 2010. Um, so this is explained, this is a layer um, that shows some colonies of a bird called the Common Mirror. Um, the locations of these colonies in the year 2010. So the columns in this attribute table are the different pieces of information that we have for each of the uh, different colonies in this data layer. And then the individual colonies are, there are the rows. So the rows are the individual features that are within a vector data layer and the columns tell you the information that we have for each of those. So for example, this date column tells you the date uh, of when this, where, when this data came from. And then the source column tells you the source of this data. And then of course, latitude and longitude tells you the location of these colonies. I'm gonna switch over now to the QGIS view so we can kind of look at these uh, attributes and these layer properties together. So let's actually go to that common mirror um, data, data layer. So 
if you open up the biology uh, layer group, within that is another layer group called birds. So we're going to open that up. And this layer here called Common Mirror Colonies 2010, that's the one that I was just showing you the example attribute table of. So I'm going to go ahead and toggle that on. And I'm going to toggle this off. OK, so now you see and a bunch of orange dots come up. So most of them actually are not in Greenland, but we have a couple over here in Greenland. Um, OK, so how do you open that attribute table to find out more information about each of these uh, colony locations? So the way that you can do that, again, there's more than one way to do this. But the way that I like to do this is to click on the common mirror colonies layer in the layers panel, right click, and then go to open attribute table. So if you select that, pops up onto another screen for me, but you'll get that same table that I just showed you. So this is what we call an attribute table for this data layer. And it gives us all sorts of information about the individual records, in this case, points in that vector layer. Um, only vector layers have attribute tables. And this will make a bit more sense here in a second. If you just want to find out general properties about any layer in QGIS, you, the way that you find out properties of any layer is very similar to what I just did. So we can highlight a layer in the layers panel, right click on it, and actually go all the way down to the bottom where it says properties. And if you select that, you should get a window that looks similar to this. So at the very top here, this information tab gives you all sorts of information about any particular data layer. So for example, um, you can see the, the data source, so where it came from. You can find out the coordinate reference system of that data set. Every data set in QGreenland will have the same coordinate reference system. And then there's an abstract that describes what that data set is. So just more information about what it shows um, and where it came from. Similarly, so there's a lot over here in this left column here, but there's a tab called metadata. So metadata or data about data gives you very similar information, just a description of the data set, a citation where it came from. Okay. I'm gonna go back to our slides here. Okay, so I talked about vector data types um, the second main type of data layer that you'll find in QGIS are what are called raster layers. So as vector layers are discrete, discrete um, pieces of information, a raster layer is a continuous data set. So it, a raster layer is made up of pixels or cells of a certain size that are organized into a regular grid. So you can imagine that, of course, the smaller the grid cell in a raster layer, the, the smoother the look of the raster layer. So I chose three different raster, raster data sets from QGreenland just to show you examples and show you how the grid cell size really does change the look of the data layer. So starting over here in the far left, this is a data layer in QGreenland called permafrost probability. You'll notice that each of these examples as I go through them has, has a, a number and a measurement next to it. That just tells you the size of the grid cell. So the permafrost probability layer, the grid cell size in this layer is 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. As we move to the middle here, another Q Greenland data layer is called geothermal heat flux. Um, and this has a slightly smaller grid cell size. And you can see what that does to the look of the, the data layer. It's a bit smoother and less pixelated than the permafrost probability layer. And then finally, on the far right here, this is a um, Greenland image mosaic, so a satellite image from 2019 of Q Greenland with a 10 meter grid cell size. So much, much smaller, much better resolution than the other two raster layers. Um, and it shows here. So uh, pictures or satellite images are one type of raster layer uh, in QGIS. All right, so how do you tell what layers in Q Greenland are raster layers and what layers are vector layers. Um, it's actually quite easy to do that. So let's go back to QGIS and take a look at some examples. 
All right, I'm gonna come back to this biology birds uh, layer group since that that's what we were looking at a second ago. And if you look at each of these individual layers within this layer group, you'll see that they have symbols to the left of them. So those symbols not only tell you whether or not a layer is raster or vector, but for vector layers, they tell you what kind of vector layer they are. So in this case, the common mirror colonies 2010, these three dots next to that layer tell you that that is a vector point layer. So moving down, this bird protected areas layer, you'll see this kind of little polygon looking thing symbol next to it. So that tells you that that is a vector polygon layer. Now let's go find a line layer to look at. So actually I'll go down to hydrology since I know this has some line layers. So in the hydrology group layer, you'll see this ice streams layer and this land streams layer both have just a very simple line next to their name. And that tells us that those are vector line layers. Uh, each of those symbols that I just pointed out has a, has a particular style, right? They have a particular color, um, a particular line or point weight or shape. Um, those are all what's referred to as the layer symbology. So in this case, they're how we chose to symbolize these layers in the map view. So for example, for this common mirror colonies layer that I have turned on, we chose to represent those points as um, various sized orange dots. But this again, like everything else in QGIS is customizable. So you can actually change the symbology. Um, and I'll show you how to do that here in a second. So if you don't like the way that this is represented, you can change that. All right, so those are the three symbols for the vector layers. How you do, do you identify a raster layer in QGIS? Well, a raster layer looks something like, here we go. So I have opened the regional climate models group layer. And within that, there's a bunch of raster layers. So if you look at this whole group here, starting with annual mean wind speed, this symbol of sort of grid cells next to it tells you that this is a raster layer. And if you turn that on, it'll be very apparent. So this is what that raster layer looks like. Now, if you look underneath this raster layer, there is just a huge set of numbers and squares. So this is basically the legend for this raster layer. This tells you what the different colors in that raster layer mean. And in this case, their annual mean wind speeds between 1958 and 2019 in meters per second. Um, so with, uh, with warmer colors, it's greater wind speed. Um, and again, you can change what these colors are and you can even change um, how big these bins are um, if you wanted to, but this is just the way we've chosen to represent this data set. All right, so how do you change these layer symbologies? Well, let's actually start with a vector data layer. And I'm gonna choose something different just for variety here. Since, since I'm a geologist by training, I'm actually gonna open up our geology layer. Let me turn this off for now and our birds layer off. So I'm going to open up our geology layer group and I'm going to turn on um, the earthquakes layer that are within that. So, and since you can see that I, I don't think I can see the full extent of this layer. So I'm going to use our, uh, use a trick to make sure that layer comes into full view in my map view. I'm going to right click on that layer and then choose zoom to layer. And that'll take me to the full extent of that data layer. And of course there is a button up here where you can do the same thing. So these dots are earthquake, um, earthquakes layer. And I'm just going to expand earthquakes so you can see what those dots show. So both the size and the color of the dot are important. Um, they tell you something about the magnitude of that earthquake. But let's say that I don't really like uh, one of the colors or the, the sizes of these, um, these symbols. So I'm gonna, I wanna change these symbols. So I'm going to right click on our earthquakes layer and I'm going to go to properties. So we've opened up this window before. And then if we look along this left sidebar here, you'll see symbology. So we'll go ahead and click on symbology. 
And we can see here's how our that data set is currently being represented in our map view. But I can change these. So I can go up here and change the symbol. So let's say I wanted them to be diamonds instead of circles. And I can change the color ramp of this particular data layer. Not every vector layer has a color ramp. This one does just because we have different magnitudes of earthquakes. I'm going to change that to something like this. Um, if you want to see what that looks like, you have to actually click apply. So you'll see we changed the symbology within this properties window, but it hasn't yet changed in our map view yet. So in order to make that change, you'll have to click on apply. So now we can see that change. And then I'm going to actually click cancel. Um, oh, it's still applied. Okay. All right, so that's how you can change the vector layer. So again, you can do the same thing for lines or polygons. Um, for raster layers, so let's open up that mean wind speed layer again. You can change the color ramp of raster layers. So again, let's open the layer properties for this particular raster layer. So right click properties. And again, on the sidebar, we'll click on symbology. And then you can see that I can change a couple of different properties of the raster color map. So I could change it to this if I wanted to. I'm gonna click apply, see what that looks like. Okay. All right. So um, I'm gonna stop here and again, just give you a few minutes to play around with uh, what I just mentioned. So feel free to um, look through the data sets in the layer panel and start to identify raster data layers from vector data layers. And then uh, if you like, go ahead and try changing some of the symbology of these layers. Um, as you'll see, I've changed the symbology. Um, and so if you want to get back to the original uh, symbology of the original Q Greenland data file, um, you can just close this and reopen the original data file. Just be sure not to save over it. Um, so we'll take about five minutes, go ahead and play around with locating the properties or the attribute table of vector layers or try changing symbologies of layers. And I'll just mention one quick thing. If you look at the practice tasks, set number two um, will help you if you want a more uh, guided way to explore and play around with some of the things I just talked about, you can check out practice tasks set number two.
All right, before we move on, um, are there any questions so far about um, symbology of data layers, how to find data layer properties, or opening an attribute table for a vector layer? All right. There's one other thing that I want to point out, another way to uh, find information about um, data layers. So the attribute table is a way that you can look at the, the full set of information for all of the records in a particular data uh, vector data layer. But sometimes you might just want to know the information about one particular feature in a vector data layer. For example, maybe I just want to know um, information, Ooh, that's zoomed in pretty far, let me zoom out. So this is still our earthquakes data layer. I just changed the symbology into these fun little stars. Um, but let's say I just wanted to know information about this one particular earthquake location. Um, the way that I can do that is by using this button here. This is called identify features. And this is located within the attributes toolbar. So if this is in a toolbar that you currently have, um, toggled on. Go ahead and toggle it on. It's a pretty handy one to have visible. I'm going to click on that button, identify features. And then I'm going to click on that particular earthquake point that I'm interested in. And when I do so, I you know it turned kind of weird and red over here. So when you do that, uh, what QGIS does is it tells you information about every single data layer that's currently toggled on. So it's actually going to give me information not just about this particular earthquake point, but it's going to give me information about this background um, Greenland layer that I also have on. So when I click on it, a new panel shows up here in the right. This is called an identify results panel. And it's basically just telling me all the information about all of the layers that were underneath the place where I clicked in the map. Here. So here, this first part here is just information about the background boundary layer, not really anything I'm interested in right now. but here is that, that earthquakes layer record that I was interested in. So if you open up this earthquakes layer here in the identifier results panel, um, this is all of the information for that one particular uh, feature that I was interested in. So another way that you can view this same information is actually by reopening the attribute table. So I'm just going to do that for this earthquakes layer. I'm going to go ahead and open its attribute table because that record that I just selected, um, it should be highlighted in the attribute table. And I can also just view that one that I'm interested in by going down here to this little box in the bottom left that says show all features. I'm going to click on that and then click on show selected features. Oh, whoops, for some reason it's not showing me. It should show me that selected feature. Oh, you know what? That's because we didn't select the feature, we just identified that. We'll come back. This is another, this is another thing. Uh, we just identified that. Okay, so the identify results button is just one way um, to find out information about one particular feature. Matt, Real quick, Lynn, is yeah, it okay if I jump in? For sure. Um, on that identify tool, not everybody may have the same uh, default settings. Uh, on the bottom of the pane, there's a mode uh, that says top down currently for you. Um, I think by default that will say current layer. So oh, great. when Excellent. that's selected, you'll only be able to identify features for the layer you have selected in the layers pane. Um, and the other options all behave differently and you can play around with those and see what they do. Top down stop at first, for example, will allow you to select anything that's visible, but it'll stop at the top layer underneath your cursor and only show you that one thing. Great, thanks Matt. That's excellent. So you can avoid uh, what I just did and getting all of the selections of all the layers. All right, I'm gonna clear this um, identify results by just hitting the clear results button and that'll make everything go back to normal color and everything disappear from this identify results panel. And then I'm gonna close this because I don't want this taking up uh, space in my interface. Yeah, let's zoom back so the full earthquakes layer is in, is in view. All right.
Okay, so back to our slides. Um, we're going to jump in now to talking about um, the QGIS processing toolbox. And this is one of the most important components of QGIS. This is what makes QGIS um, a really powerful geospatial analysis tool. So the processing toolbox is just um, a big database of a lot of built-in functions that you can use to analyze or query data in QGIS. Um, and we are going to run through some examples using some of these tools, just so you can get a sense of what they do. But there are many, many of these tools and functions available to analyze and query data in, in QGIS. So the first example that we're going to do is we are going to use a tool in the processing toolbox to answer the question, which populated in regions in Greenland have more than 5,000 people? So that's the question we are going to answer um, using a function in this toolbox. So let's go back to QGIS. And because we care about uh, towns and populated places in Greenland. I'm not going to turn off this earthquakes layer because we're not looking at that. And I'm going to turn on this towns and settlements layer underneath places. So this is the layer that we care about to answer this question. Um, how many places in Greenland have more than 5,000 people? All right, in order to access the processing toolbox, if you look up here, and this toolbar, there's this little button that, that has a gear symbol. If you click on that, that will bring up the processing toolbox. In my case, it shows up in a new panel on the left side of my interface. So go ahead and click on that symbol and open up the processing toolbox. So can you please repeat that just, just one time real quick? to open the processing toolbox. Yeah, for sure. Let me close it so we can redo that. So um, so in this, this particular toolbar, so this is the attributes toolbar. Can you see my mouse moving across the top of the interface here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Thank so you. yep. So this, the gear symbol, that's the button that'll open up the processing toolbox. So if you click on that, it should open it up. Did that work okay? Yes, thank you. OK, great. All right. So um, take a minute to just look at this processing toolbox. So much like the layers in the way that they're organized, the processing toolbox is, is organized by kind of um, bigger topics of, of things that you can do and analyses that you can do in QGIS. Uh, and they're separated into raster tools. So you'll notice there is a couple different categories for raster tools. And then there's several different categories for vector tools. So we analyze these two different data sets differently since they are pretty different. Um, and Matt also reminded me in the chat that another way to access the processing toolbox besides using the button is to use the menu bar. So if you go to view in the menu bar and go to toolbars, um, you should be able also. I'm sorry, panels, not toolbars. I was going to say, I'm like, <laughs> my That's mistake. Okay. No problem. Um, yeah, if you go to panels, the processing toolbox panel is something that you can make sure um, that you can click on, and that'll do the same thing. That'll bring up this panel on the right side here. Um, so, for better or for worse, there are multiple ways to get to things in, in QGIS. All right, so for this particular question, so again, the question is how many uh, populated places in Greenland have more than 5,000 people? We are going to use um, a vector analysis tool since the populated places is a point vector layer. So we're down here in the processing toolbox. And in fact, the, the tool that we want is going to be within the vector selection category. So go ahead and click on the little arrow next to vector selection and expand that category. And you'll see all the tools that fall within that. And we want to use the tool called select by attribute. So what this is going to do is this is going to allow us to select features from that populated places vector layer that fulfill certain um, uh, that, that fulfill what, what it is we want them to be. So in this case, we're going to be looking for uh, those populated places that have a population greater than 5,000. So double click on select by attribute. 
And that should bring up a window that looks similar to this. And we're just gonna fill in some of these parameters and then run this tool and that should help us answer our question. So starting at the top here, the input layer, the layer that we are analyzing using this tool, again, is that um, towns and settlements layer. So when you click on that, this opens up all of the data layers that are in Q Greenland. So it's in this case, they're organized alphabetically. You'll notice they're not actually organized by group layers like they are in the layers panel, um, which actually makes it easy because we know what layer we're looking for. So we're just going to scroll down um, to our towns and settlements. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna um, I'm gonna make a quick change because it turns out the layer we want here is actually populated places. So I apologize for that. Um, not towns and settlements. We want the populated places. Point layer. It's still a point layer. Um, there's going to be a lot of overlap, but we're going to choose that because that's the layer that actually has population information, which is what we're interested in. All right. So make sure populated places is our input layer. And then selection attribute, this is the, the attribute that we are going to be querying. So in this case, since we wanna know the number of places that have more than 5,000 people, we care about the population attribute. So go ahead and click on population. And then we're just going to fill in these next two parts to fulfill um, the query that we're interested in. So our operator is going to be greater than, because we're interested in populations greater than 5,000. And for the value box, you'll just type in 5,000. And I'm just gonna leave this last box here as default. So it should say creating new selection because we're just um, creating a new selection from this layer. All right, double check you have the same parameters entered in as I do. And then once you do, go ahead and click on run down on the bottom left. Once you do that, it should automatically close this window. All right, so at this point, um, you might not see anything special. So where did our selection go? There's a few different ways that you can view the results of this selection. So I'm gonna show you what those are. One, um, it's hard to tell from this viewpoint, but if you start to zoom in and actually we need to turn on our populated places. Here it is. So underneath places, community map, crowdsource, that's what we want. We want this populated places. So I'm gonna turn off towns and settlements. So if you start to zoom in on this map, it'll become apparent that some of those populated places are highlighted. So for example, it's a little bit hard to tell because it has a name over it. Right here, we have a populated place that's highlighted yellow, but not all of them are. So you can actually look in the map view and see the selected populated places that have a population of greater than 5,000. This isn't the most useful view maybe because these dots are pretty small. So another way that you can do that is actually what I showed you earlier um, incorrectly with the identify features button, but this is now the, the, the place to use it. You can right click on populated places and open that layers attribute table. And then we're going to go down here to the button that says show all features, click on it and select show selected features. And that'll show us all of the populated places that fulfilled that um, requirement that we just entered into our select by attribute tool. So all of the populated places that have populations greater than 5,000. All right, um, any questions on how to use that tool in the, the processing toolbox? And if you had any issues with it or it didn't work out for you how it did for me, make sure to let us know and we can troubleshoot for you. All right, we're gonna do several more examples here with the processing toolbox, but I wanna give you 
um, a chance to do another select by attribute function on your own. So if you look at the practice tasks document, um, I challenge you to use that same select by attribute tool to do an analysis of your choosing. So choose a different vector layer from the one that we just used and figure out um, an analysis you wanna do that uses the select by attribute tool. So that probably involves opening the layers attribute table just to understand the attributes available for that layer. And that'll help you make a decision about what you wanna query, what attribute you're interested in selecting for. So I'll give you about five or so minutes to play around with that tool or other, other tools within that same family. And then we'll move ahead and do some more examples with this toolbox.
if you were able to use the select by attribute tool to do a different query of another QGreenlit data set, feel free to put that into the chat and just describe what you did. Um, that will give folks a sense of uh, the other possible ways that you can use that tool with QGreenlit. So feel free to share if you feel comfortable. All right, so let's keep going with this processing toolbox and use it to do some other useful things with QGreenland. Um, so one really um, key thing to know how to do with QGreenland, I think, is to, um, to extract data from certain QGreenland data layers that are just within Greenland. So you'll notice um, when we looked, for example, at some of the, the bird colony layers that a lot of the data sets in QGreenland actually extend outside the border, the boundary of Greenland itself. And it might be that you just want to analyze data sets or data that's within Greenland and not say in Iceland or Canada, and their surrounding land masses. So there's a way that we can extract data from a data layer in QGIS um, that are just within uh, a, the, the Greenland uh, boundary itself or that fulfill certain requirements. And that's a useful thing to do. So let's, let's try that one out. So we are, let's go ahead and look back at that bird colonies layer since I know for sure there are colonies of birds outside of Greenland in that data layer. So I'm gonna go to biology and birds. And in this case, I'm going to toggle on the thick build muir colonies 2010. And I'm going to zoom to that layer just so it comes into full view. And you'll notice it's a bit hard to see because it blends in with this green background layer. But these green circles are the locations of thick build muir colonies in 2010. So again, there's many in Greenland, but there's also some over in Canada and surrounding land masses. So we want to extract just the colonies that are within Greenland and exclude the colonies that are outside of Greenland. So the tool that we are going to use for that is actually um, pretty apparent. So we're still in the vector selection area of the processing toolbox. We're going to use this tool called extract by location. So that allows us to extract these bird colonies that are just within Greenland. So go ahead and double click on that tool. And it should open up a window that looks similar to this. And again, we'll just go down and fill in each of these parameters. So first off, um, if you don't already have the Thick Build Mirror Colonies 2010 listed in the Extract Features From box at the top here, go ahead and select it from our list. And then I'm actually going to skip where the features with these boxes, I'm gonna skip this really quickly and just fill in by comparing to the features from, because that's actually going to inform which of these boxes that we check. There's a data layer in Q Greenland that is just the outline of Greenland and it is called Greenland Coastlines 2017. It's a vector polygon layer. So this Greenland Coastlines 2017 layer is the layer that we want to be here where it says by comparing the features from. So what we're actually gonna do is we want to extract features from this thick build mirror colonies data set that are within the Greenland coastline or the Greenland boundaries. 
Um, so I'm going to check R within. But I'm also going to check a couple of other of these boxes just to cover our bases, just to make sure, for example, if one of those colonies is sitting right on the Greenland coastlines layer, intersects it, we want to make sure that we're accounting for that. I'm also going to check the box touch and overlap and cross. These three don't really pertain here. All right. So this is going to help us extract the thick build mirror colonies that are just within Greenland. So make sure you have similar parameters filled into what I have here. And then this final box here allows you either to create a, what's called a temporary scratch layer. So this is just a temporary layer that when you close this project will be deleted. If you want to save this as a permanent layer, you can do so by clicking over here on these three dots and just saving, giving this a file that will be extracted, these features of file name and saving it somewhere in your computer. And I'm just going to leave it as a temporary file for now. All right, so click run. Um, in this case, this window doesn't actually close automatically, so I'm going to close it myself. And then if we look over here at our layers panel, you should see a layer that's named almost exactly as mine. It should be called extracted location. Now, a quick aside, when you do um, a query or an analysis with a tool that creates a new layer, that new layer is going to show up in the layers panel underneath whatever layer you had selected. So because I had this bird's layer group selected before I ran that analysis, that extracted data layer actually shows up within that layer group. Um, if you wanted to move it out of that group or move it to a different location, you can certainly do that. Like most things, just right click. And then you can choose move out of group. So if you choose that, it'll move it out of the bird's group into its own group. Um, or you can choose move to top. That'll just move it to the very top of our data layers. But I'm going to keep it in this group because it, it fits. Um, this also isn't a very descriptive name. So if, if you wanted to rename it to something that was more descriptive, you can also do that. Again, right click, select rename layer. And I'm going to call it Mirror Colonies in Greenland. All right. And again, we can change the symbology of this layer if we don't like it to make it something um, that is that is easier to see. Now I'm going to point out um, a quirk, something that is a little weird here. So I'm going to toggle on and off these. It might be a bit hard to see, actually. But if you actually start to examine the results of this query, you'll notice that QGIS didn't actually select for every single thick build mirror colony that's within Greenland. There are a couple of colonies that for some reason or another are located just outside that boundary layer of Q Greenland that this particular query didn't select. Um, and before I tell you how to take care of that problem, Matt, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask if you could turn off the community map layer. Oh, group. for it's sure. Thanks. Make it a little bit more confusing to see. Oh, the points. great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I'm actually, let me change the symbology of this mirror colony so that it's really apparent the difference between this and the original one. So I'll go to properties. And again, I'll make it this kind of crazy symbol just so it's easy to see. Okay. All right. So here's, here's, oops. I think there's an example. Oop. Somewhere around. If anybody can find the data set that it didn't get, let me know. Oh, actually, it looks like it did a pretty decent job. 
with this analysis, I'm pretty sure there's one or two thick build mirror colonies that didn't get selected because they kind of fall outside. Oh, Lynn, I think you've got your uh, thick, original thick build mirror colony layer hidden. Oh, this I haven't hidden. Thanks, yeah. Matt. There we go. Okay. That's much better. Here we go. That's that, That's more obvious. All right, here's a great example. So this this particular colony was not extracted, even though it should have been, because this clearly is one that is within Greenland. And the reason is you can zoom in pretty far and just see. Um, it's kind of in a weird place. This might be a bit of an error um, or there's, there's you know, error and uncertainty in all of these maps, but um, this should be have been selected, but it wasn't because it didn't fulfill any of those parameters that we filled in for the extract by location. Um, so there's a way that we can fix this. And the way that we can fix this is by actually creating a buffer around that coastlines layer that extends far out enough so it captures these kind of weird anomalous layers. So let's look at how you do that. All right. So before I actually show you the tool to use, we need to figure out what size or what distance that buffer is going to be. Um, so we are gonna measure the difference or the distance between the various points that were excluded from that previous analysis and the Greenland coastlines layer, which is this. This is the closest of the, of the Greenland coastline layer. So you can make measurements in Q Greenland um, using one of the buttons in the toolbars. So this measure line tool here that looks like a little ruler, this is in our attributes toolbar. If you click on the little arrow next to it, you'll see that you can measure lots of different things with this tool, areas, angles, and lines. But in this case, we're just gonna use the measure line function. So click on that. Should get a little window that pops up. I'm gonna go ahead and change the distance that I'm measuring into kilometers because I know that this measurement is going to be um, large enough to warrant that, not meters. And then just click on the colony that was missed. In this case, I'll click on this. And if you move your mouse around, you'll see it extends a line out. And in the box here, it tells you the, the length of that line. And so if I just draw that line over to this little set of islands over here, I'll see that that distance is about three kilometers. Now you can go around and do this for the other points, the other colonies that were missed in that extraction uh, process, but I'll just go ahead and let you know that our buffer is gonna need to be about 10 kilometers um, to make sure that we get the point that's the farthest from the coastlines layer. So 10 kilometers is the magic number. All right, I'm gonna close this box. So we're gonna use a tool in a new category in our processing toolbox. So I'm just gonna close this vector selection group for now and open up vector geometry. And you'll see underneath vector geometry, there's a tool literally called buffer. So that's the one we're gonna use. So go ahead and double click on that. So we're gonna use this tool to draw a buffer around the Greenland coastlines 2017 layer. So for the input layer, we wanna make sure this is that layer. So I'm gonna scroll up and select that Greenland coastlines layer, Greenland coastlines 2017. And then I mentioned that 10 kilometers is gonna be the distance that we want for our buffer. So make sure 10 is in distance and that your units are set to kilometers. And then I'm going to actually just leave all of these other numbers and settings as default. If you look on this side here, this little panel on the right side gives you more information about what these different things mean. Feel free to check that out, but I'm just going to leave them as is. All right, so now we'll click run.
Oh, this one's taking a bit longer to process. There we go. Now I'm going to close my window. I'm going to zoom out here because this is a little too. There we go. All right, so just as with the last example, a new layer showed up in our layers panel. That new layer is also going to show up in our new layers panel, um, named something like buffered. So you see it here. And again, this is going to appear in the layers panel in whatever group we had selected. So I probably should have selected the same group as the Greenland's coastline layer just to make sure it showed up in the same place, but it's not the biggest deal. I'm going to leave it here for now, but again, you can right click and move it out of this group or rename it if you like. So if you look at your map view and just kind of zoom in, zoom out, take a look at what happened, you'll see that around that Greenland coastlines layer, so around the coastline of Greenland, there's now this big yellow buffer. So basically turn that coastline into a very, very thick line. And I can go back and run that same analysis I just did, extracting the Muir colonies by location. But instead of using the Greenland's coastline layer, I'm going to actually use this buffered layer. So I'm going to do that just to show you. So I'm going to turn off this, in this first Muir colonies layer that we extracted for now, just to get rid of those giant stars. I'm going to close our vector geometry category over here and then open back up vector selection. And then go back to extract by location. So this is the tool that we use to extract those Muir colonies in Greenland. All right, I again want to extract features from Thick Build Muir Colonies 2010. Make sure to choose the original data set that includes all of those colonies, not just the one that we just extracted. And then coming down, kind of skipping these boxes for now, coming down to this by comparing to the features from. Mine already has the correct layer listed. You want to make sure to choose that buffered layer that we just created. And again, we'll select intersect, touch, overlap, R within and cross just to cover our bases. And again, I'll leave this as a temporary layer and run it. All right, so here we are. Here's the new extracted Muir colonies layer. Oh, still misses some colonies. That's interesting, colonies that are in Greenland. I thought that it managed to get them all, but I could be wrong about that. This should have taken care of the problem um, of our missed colonies. I'm gonna change the symbology just, just so we can see it better. Uh, all right, so here's how we know that one worked a little better. So let's zoom in here. So you can kind of toggle on and off this original mirrors colony layer that we extracted using just the Greenland coastlines layer. And then the mirror colony layer, I haven't changed the name of it yet, so it still says extracted, but this is the new one we extracted and you can see there's a difference. So that last analysis using the buffered coastline did capture some of these um, mirror colonies that weren't extracted the first time around. And Wolfgang says that it, it still misses some points, which might be true. So you can go back and do this again with a different buffer size if that's the case. But that's just a really um, nice thing to know about in case you do run one of these tools and it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. All right, I'm gonna pause there in case there are any questions about this. Okay, 
Um, and again, there are tons of different tools that you can use to analyze vector layers, but I want to show you how you can analyze raster layers. So I'm going to sh just show one example of one of the raster analysis tools. So we are going to use a raster analysis tool to answer um, this question here. What is a good estimate of the Greenland ice sheets volume? So we're gonna use a raster analysis tool called raster surface volume for this. So let's go back to GIS. And I am going to open up this raster analysis tool group. And within that, I'm going to select raster surface volume. And that should open up a window that looks similar to this. All right, so here are the parameters we're gonna fill in to answer this question. Our input layer here is going to be um, this layer called ice thickness 150 meters. So you'll notice that all of the layers that show up as possible choices to choose are all raster layers, which makes sense since this is a raster analysis tool. So click on ice thickness, that's gonna be our input layer. I'm going to leave this band number as is. And I'm also going to leave this base level as is. It's, it should be set at zero. This is just telling us that we're interested in ice thickness values that are greater than zero. And then for method, I am going to choose count only above base level. So basically everything above zero. And again, I'm going to leave these boxes as are saving to temporary files. If you wanna save them to permanent files, you certainly can do so by clicking on these three dots. And then I'm going to click run. All right. I'm going to close this box and you'll notice that we have a new panel that appeared just below the processing toolbox. And this panel shows something called a surface volume report. So this new file that showed up this link is actually the link to the surface volume report file. So I'm just gonna open that. In this case, it opens it in my browser. And it gives me actually the numbers that I'm hoping for. They're not in the best format, but they are the answer to the question. So this number here, volume, is the answer to our question. So again, our question was, what is a good estimate of the green on ice sheets volume? It doesn't say it here, but this number is in cubic meters, and you can figure out what the units for this layer are by looking at the layer properties. And in cubic kilometers, this should be about 2.9 million cubic kilometers. So just double check you're able to get that same number. So that's just a really great example of the power of these processing tools. We were able to um, calculate a good estimate of the Greenland ice sheet volume using just one single tool in about five minutes. All right, if you have any questions about any of those tools, again, feel free to add them into the chat, but I'm just gonna move us along to the next thing in the interest of time. Um, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about editing data layers um, adding new data layers and creating data layers from scratch. So I'm going to turn all of these off. I'm going to close the processing toolbox in this panel just to kind of clean everything up. And I'm going to zoom to our full extent. All right. So 
let's start with um, how to edit existing data layers in QGIS, existing QGreenland data layers. So to edit data layers, you'll actually notice this is only going to be possible with vector data layers. So point, line, and polygon data layers are the ones that you can edit. And the way that you edit them is you'll need access to this toolbar here which is called the digitizing toolbar. So if you don't already have this one visible in your toolbar, go ahead and right click on your toolbar and toggle that on, the digitizing toolbar. All right, um, to edit a data layer, we first have to select the data layer that we wanna edit. And in this case, I'm gonna change things up and I'm going to choose to edit this layer called ice cores, which is under our glaciology group. This is a point vector layer. And this layer shows us locations where ice cores have been extracted from Greenland. I'm gonna zoom into this layer. And let's say that I went to Greenland and, ex and extracted a new ice core, and I wanted to add it to this data layer. Uh, so I would be wanting to add a new point to this data layer of a new ice core location. So first, make sure that ice cores is um, toggled on and is selected in your layers panel. So it's highlighted here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to our digitizing toolbar and you're going to select that little pencil button. It's called toggle editing. So basically we're toggling editing on so we can make edits to that layer. So as soon as we click that button, you'll see a lot of other buttons in that digitizing toolbar are suddenly active. All right, I'm going to select this button in that same toolbar called add point feature since that's exactly what I wanna do. So go ahead and select that button. And then you'll notice that my mouse is how tur now turned into this different little symbol, this little target symbol and so now wherever I click in our map view, it's gonna add a new point for me, a new ice core location. So I'm just gonna say that that ice core location is here. When you click before it actually adds a point, it's gonna make you fill in the attributes for that new feature. So I'm gonna fill in a couple of these things. And these are the attributes you'd find in the ice core attribute table. The FID is just an identifier for each, for each individual attribute. I'm going to let QJS auto-generate that. I'm not gonna do that myself, but I am going to name it. So I'm just gonna call this lens new ice core. You can name it whatever you would like. And then I'm gonna leave some of these blank just in the interest of time. You'll ideally want to, to fill them all out, but I am gonna add a timestamp. That's just gonna be the time when that ice core is collected. And then for now, just leaving everything as is, I'm gonna say, okay. And there's my new ice core location right there. So if we open up the ice core attribute table, you should be able to find your new ice core. And there's my Lynn's new ice core. I'm gonna come back to this attribute table in a minute, but I do wanna say that um, before you turn editing of this layer off, you wanna make sure to save your edits. And the way that you save your edits is by clicking the save edits button in that same toolbar. So I actually am gonna save it. You don't have to, if you don't wanna actually add a new layer to this because we can delete that layer or that new data point just as we can add it later on. And then before you do anything else, once you're done editing, be sure just to toggle editing off again. I'm actually gonna keep it on for now because I wanna show you one other thing. Let's open that attribute table again for ice cores. So just as you can edit a feature in the map view for a layer, you can also edit 
its records in the attribute table. And it's a very similar process. So here in this toolbar at the top of the attribute table, this is what we're going to use to edit the attribute table. In this case, because I'm already editing this layer, it should be already toggled on. But if it's not, you can go ahead and toggle editing on. And then that allows me to change anything in this layer, in this attribute table that I want to. So let's say that for that new layer that I just added, I didn't initially add a description, but now I want to, I could go ahead and do that now. And then just as I did before, I'll want to make sure to save edits and then toggle editing off when I'm done. All right, so that's just one example of how to edit one particular point layer. Um, you can definitely edit any other vector layer that you want to, lines and polygons. You can add new features. You can delete new features. You can edit their attribute tables. But now I want to actually show you um, how do you actually create a new vector layer from scratch? So instead of just editing or adding or subtracting from an, an existing data layer in Keygreenland, how do you just create a, a data layer completely from scratch? I'm gonna turn this ice cores layer off for now and then zoom out just so Greenland is filling up our map view. So remember that data layers in QGIS come in different forms. So there's vector layers, raster layers. Um, I wanna create a new vector layer here and in this case, I'm gonna create what's called a new shape file layer, which is just one kind of vector layer. So we wanna be using something called, oops, here we go, data source manager toolbar. So this toolbar here is the toolbar I'll be using to create a new vector data layer. So just make sure that your data source manager toolbar is turned on. I'm gonna select this button called New Shape File Layer. That should open up a box that looks like this. So this is where, where we're gonna set up the parameters for our new layer. So you'll wanna give it a name. So I'm just gonna call it New Point Layer. And then you'll want to fill in its geometry. So in this case, I want a point, but you can give it any vector geometry you like if you are creating a line layer. And then down here, this is where we're going to set up our attribute table. So we're going to create the different fields that are going to live in the attribute table. So let's say that this new point layer um, are going to be places that I, I know I want to go out and do some field research that I want to collect the new data symbols from. And so I'm going to, I'll definitely want an attribute called site name. So I'll call it site name. And then you need to give each attribute a data type. So that can be anything from a string text data to a number to a date. In this case, this is just going to be text. So I'll leave it as is. And then I'm going to shorten the length a little bit to 30 characters, but you can leave it if you like. And then when you click on the button called add to fields list, that field should show up down here. And again, these are the fields that are going to populate the attribute table for this new data layer. So you can add as many as you like and then click OK. And that new layer should show up in your layers panel. Again, it actually showed up here in Glaciology since that's a layer I had selected, but I can move it out. And I can rename it by right clicking and selecting rename. And then we can actually create, we can populate this new layer with points by using the exact same method we did to edit that last point layer. So I would select it, I'd toggle editing on, and then I'd start adding points. So same thing as last time. All right. One more thing I wanna show you before we learn how to make a map 
is how to add a new data layer to your Green, Q Greenland project that isn't already in Q Greenland. So let me just toggle editing off. I'm going to turn that point layer off. There we go. So you can add many different data layers to the existing Q Greenland data project. And the toolbar that we want to use for that is this one on the side here for me called Manage Layers Toolbar. So if you don't have that toolbar on, go ahead and toggle it on. And you'll notice we can add a bunch of different kinds of data layers to Q Greenland or to QGIS. And in this case, I actually have an example point layer that we can practice with. So um, actually, I think I'm gonna let you guys try this on your own. So if you go to our Google Drive folder, there's a folder here that's called adding a new data set. Within that folder, there are three different files called potential data collection locations. So this is a data set that, a point data set that I made up that we can use to practice adding a new data set to our Q Greenland project. So go ahead, open that folder and download all three of these files to whatever location you choose on your computer. Just make sure you remember where that is. And you'll notice that this layer has a layer, a, a file extension of GPKG. That means geo package. That's one of the layer types that vector layers can be in QGreenland. They can also be shapefile layers, but we made all of our, our vector layers in QGreenland geo package. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what that is, you can look at our user guide or documentation for QGIS online. All right, so to add that new data layer to our Q Greenland project, we're gonna to go to these buttons in our manage layers toolbar here. And since we know that's a vector layer, I'm gonna click on this button that's called add vector layer. And that should bring up a window that looks something like this. And then I'm just gonna to navigate to that place in my computer where I know that vector data set is. So if you click on this three little buttons here, that'll help you browse to that data file on your computer. And the one that we're interested in is just the one with the GPKG file extension. So I'll select that one, click open, and then click add, and then close this window. And here it is. So this Again, this is in my glaciology folder or a layer group just because that's the one that I had selected at the time. And you can see the new point layer has shown up in my Q Greenland project. So that's how you add a vector layer. You can do the same thing to add other layer types too, such as raster layers using that same toolbar. All right, I'm going to take about um, three to five minutes just to let you play around with um, adding or editing or creating new data layers. And then we'll come back and the last thing that we'll talk about is how to create a map. Hey, Lynn, are you still here? Yep. Um, there's a couple people having some permission errors. And uh, if um, Trey su suggested a solution, and if they still have trouble, we may want to make like a breakout room or something so we can help them out. Oh, great. OK. Thanks, Matt. Just let us know if you continue having problems after following Trey's advice, and we'll uh, get a screen share going and help you out. 
Oh, so this is this just occurs when trying to create a new a new layer, a new point layer. Yeah, that seems okay. to be what's happening for these two people. Clearly ah, okay. Well, thanks for letting us know. We'll um, like yeah, like Matt said, Trey suggested um, a possible fix to that. If it doesn't work, let us know. Um, and in general, if you ever run into any issues, definitely let us know because there are things that different people experience that we're not aware of and that will help us troubleshoot and find solutions and uh, make sure that we can include those in FAQs on our website. Okay, um, so before we move on to talking about how to create a map um, using QGIS for prints or for publication, um, I just want to mention that there are a lot of really great questions coming up in the chat. Um, and a lot of the things that we're not going to be able to cover here, you can find more information about them either in our user guide that's included in the Q Greenland download package. That's a, 
um, mini page user guide that includes lots of information on, on QGreenland and how to do things in QGIS. Um, and also there's really great documentation for QGIS generally that you can find online to learn how to do um, really anything you wanna do in QGIS. All right, so the last thing that I want to um, talk about is how do you to take the Q Greenland data and, and create a map for it that you might want to include in a publication or um, print. So in order to do that, we need to get to a new uh, layout, which is called our, our print layout. So I'm going to go up here to project in our menu bar. And I'm going to go down to where it says new print layout. So that's one way you can get to a new print layout, project new print layout. But of course, there's a toolbar button for that as well. That is this here. This toolbar button is in the project toolbar called new print layout. So either way, that will help you get to a print layout. Before you actually get to that print layout, QGIS will ask you to title your new map. Or if you don't do that, um, it just will automatically generate one. I'm going to be pretty uncreative here and just call it new map and click OK. All right, so once you do that, you should see your print layout. So it should look something like this. And when you first see your print layout, it will be blank. There won't be anything there. And that's exactly how it should look right now. But of course, we don't want it to be blank. So we'll want to add a map to the layout. So the way we're going to do that is I'm going to come over here and click on this button in this side toolbar here. This is our toolbox. That's called Add New Map to the Layout. And that's going to bring up a crosshairs. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to draw a box in this layout that is going to be the size of the map that I want. So you might want to create a map that fills up this entire page, or you want, might want to create a map that just fills up a certain proportion of it. I'm actually going to draw something kind of like this, because on that right side, I'm going to put some map elements like a legend and a north arrow. All right, so once you draw that space for your map, you should actually see whatever the last map view in your QGIS interface was show up within that box. If you have any problems or it doesn't look like this, just let us know. Now, it might be that this is not the view you want to have for your map. This is not the way that you want to have it look. So you can change the extent of this map view. You can zoom in and out or you can move it around by using other buttons here in this same toolbox toolbar. In fact, this move item content button is the one that will do just that. So if you click on that button and click and scroll, you can move around to whatever extent you want and you can zoom in and out. So that, that looks exactly how you want it to look. So again, the way we did that was we added a map to this layout by clicking on the button that says add a new map and then drawing the space. And then we can use the move item content button to make that look exactly as we want it to. How are you zooming in and out? Were you using your scroll wheel to do that? I was using my scroll wheel to do that, cool. yes. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. All right, so um, what's really neat about creating a map in QGIS is there's lots of different things that you can add to a map layout. So in addition to the map itself, which is probably the key component, you can add different components like a scale bar, a north arrow, um, you can add a legend, you can add labels or text, you can even add um, pictures if you want to. So if you actually wanted to show a picture of what one of these these points looks like from the ground, you could add that to your map layout, which is pretty neat. But I'm actually just going to add some very, very simple components. I'm going to add a scale bar. So that's something I can add using the same toolbox with the scale bar button. So I'll click on that. And then I'm actually going to put that on the map itself. So just like drawing that map space, you draw 
where you want that scale bar to show up and then you can scale it however you would like. And then you'll notice that when I drew that, a panel showed up in the, in the right here. So you can actually change the look of this scale bar to whatever you want it to look like by playing around with these parameters, the units, um, the, how, how it's segmented, and then some of the colors and things like that. So you can change it to look however you would like. I'm gonna leave it as is though. So take a few minutes and make sure you have the map looking as you like it. If you wanna show a different data set, so remember this is that data set I added of potential study site locations, but if you wanna make a map of a completely different Q Greenland data set, go ahead and go back to your interface um, and choose those. And then you can come back to this print layout and then start adding the components you'd like. So scale bar, if you wanna add a north arrow, go ahead and add that. If you wanna add a legend, go ahead and, and add that too. So I'm gonna give you um, about, actually what we're gonna do, I have a final task for you that includes creating a map. Um, so I'll either give you the option of doing that final task, or you can just stay here and play around with this map layout um, and just get an idea of how you can create a map to look at the way that you want it to look. But if you do want to do this task, you can go to our shared folder, to our practice tasks. And on the second page is that final practice task. So the final practice task is just using the processing toolbox to do a very simple data analysis using one or more of the Q Greenland data layers, and then create a simple map of your results. So I'll give you about 10 minutes or so to work on this. And at the end of it, I'll show you how you can export this map as a PDF or image file.
All right, hopefully, so you had some luck. Um, if you chose to do the practice task, playing around with the processing toolbox, analyzing some data, and then creating a map of it. Um, my map appears to currently have frozen, so I can't, I can't move anything around, but um, you should be able to move things around and change the sizes and locations, positions of things on the map layout. Um, like I said, there are some quirks at QGIS, so sometimes, sometimes things happen. Um, but I wanna quickly show you the last step in the creating a map um, process, which is exporting that map as an image or a PDF or another kind of file. Um, so the way that you do that, um, once you are done with creating your map is to go up to the menu bar. This is the menu bar for the print layout view and choose layout. And then you'll see that there's multiple options here for exporting this, exporting it as an image, a PDF and SVG. So clicking on any one of these things will bring up a box that of course will ask you to, to name your map and um, choose the location where you wanna save it on your computer. And that's the last step in that process. Um, what I'm going to do is in our shared drive folder, I'm going to add after the workshop, a new folder um, where if you like, this is totally optional, you should feel free to share um, a map that you've created and exported so that other folks um, from the workshop can just see different possibilities and different ways that folks make maps. So again, this is totally optional, but if you'd like to share yours, there will be a folder here right after the workshop where you can just drop your map in for others to look at. All right. Since we are coming up on the end of the workshop, I wanna make sure to leave some time for questions um, or in case anybody is having any issues with anything we've done in the workshop. But before we do that, I just wanna mention a few final things. Um, so again, looking at our shared drive folder, I uh, just wanna let everybody know, I think I mentioned this at the beginning, there's a document in this folder that has step-by-step -step instructions for all of the examples that we did in this workshop um, and some ones that we didn't get to. So for example, when we did the that um, processing toolbox example, looking at populated regions in Greenland with more than 5,000 people, full set of steps on how we did that here. Um, and lots of other things. So just in case you forget how to do those in the future, you have this reference document that you can look to, to remember. Um, one other thing too is after the workshop, you'll get another email from us that will have a link to uh, another survey. So this is just a survey where you can share how this workshop went for you, any feedback that you have from us. Um, and it, if there is something that you can imagine uh, adding to Q Greenland or functionality or data layers you'd like to see in the future, um, it's another place for you to provide feedback to us so that we can make this the, the best tool possible for um, as many people as possible. So um, with that, I just wanna say, thanks so much for joining us today. I really hope this was useful. I know it's a lot of information. Uh, but again, in addition to the, the document here with step-by-step -step instructions, do check out our full user guide that's included with the download package that will give you a lot more information about QGreenland, about the data layers, and about analyzing them um, in QGreenland. So everything we did today and more. Um, so in this last five minutes, I'd just like to make sure that uh, we can address any, any final questions you may have. Um, and if you don't, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And again, thanks for joining us.